Hello again, everybody, and welcome to our updated talk on stroke syndromes. Now, I expect that you have watched my video on stroke and stroke management, because I'm not going to go into management here, and that you watch my video on neuroanatomy, or that you have already a good understanding of neuroanatomy. Now, I'm really going to focus here on the more common causes of stroke, um, I will give some passing reference to the less common causes. Know that if you're taking step one, you do need to be familiar with the less common causes because it's more of a neuroanatomy test. Whereas step two and step three, you really want to focus on the more common causes. And I'll point out what the most the more common causes are. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get, and I thank all those of you uh, who have already stepped up. It helps offset the cost of these videos. Also, uh, if you haven't yet, definitely consider subscribing. Just hit the button, hit the subscribe, and uh, you'll get notifications as I put more and more videos up. All right, so this is the fundamentals of stroke and TIA. I go over this in the stroke video. Most strokes are ischemic, a minority are hemorrhagic. Ischemic is due to blockage, hemorrhagic is due to bleeding. Um, always, 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 if you've got a patient coming in with sudden focal neurologic signs, especially if they're older, your next diagnostic test is a CT and it's a non-contrast CT. Now, you're, that's gonna be your next step after you stabilize them. So you have to make sure they're stable first. We get a non-contrast CT, why? Because this will help us know if it is hemorrhagic, okay? Because if it is hemorrhagic, our next step is to call neurosurgery. Whereas if it's ischemic, we may be doing TPA. You do not want to give TPA to somebody who's bleeding. Okay, that would be a very, very bad idea. So that's why we want to rule out a hemorrhagic stroke before we go ahead with definitive treatment. So this is what you see on the left here. We have hemorrhagic strokes here. We have bleeding into the ventricles. This right here on the bottom right is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You should be familiar with how that looks on CT. And then here on the right... Uh, we see ischemic stroke. Now, ischemic stroke can be very difficult to, uh, to see, and often when you have a patient presenting with a new stroke within the last hour or two, you're not going to see anything on CT. It's going to look normal. Uh, it's not until maybe a, t a day, two days, three days afterwards where you really start to see features of the stroke on CT. And what you see is hypoattenuation. So it starts to look a little darker on CT. So this area, for instance, right here is where the stroke is. Or this area, this is a little bit harder to see, but it's right here. Okay, hypoattenuation. That's what we look for. So can you see the hypoattenuation here? These are both massive strokes. So here and here, and I wish I had red, but all I got is black here. Okay. Now this is the arterial circulation. I go over this in neuroanatomy. You wanna know this cold, especially if you're taking step one, you will get asked a question about this. Step two and three, it's helpful to know, but you're not gonna be asked to point anything out on a diagram. All right, the major regions of stroke are in the anterior circulation, MCA, ACA, and ophthalmic. And in the posterior circulation, it's PCA, pica, and basilar. MCA stroke is the most common stroke. It's going to affect the upper extremities more than the lower extremities. It also uh, can interfere with language. So there are two types of MCA strokes, superior division and inferior division. I'll go into those when we get to that. ACA stroke affects the lower extremities more than the upper extremities. It also, that area is responsible for pelvic floor musculature. So if you have a loss there, you're going to have urinary incontinence. The ophthalmic artery is the first major branch of the internal carotid. Uh, it is commonly affected with stroke, particularly TIA, which is a precursor essentially to stroke. Um, and so what will happen here, if you have an actual stroke, um, you're gonna lose vision in that eye. You'll have uh, like retinal pallor and stuff like that. Um, if you have a TIA, what you'll have is this temporary loss of vision in one eye, and then it goes away. The vision comes back. That's called amaurosis fugax. If you have a patient that presents with that, you need to work them up pronto. PCA. 
PCA is the posterior part of the brain where we have our visual cortex. So you're primarily going to have visual symptoms here. Uh, however, it the PCA does supply parts of the basal ganglia, so you can have balance issues and cranial nerve dysfunctions. Pica supplies the posterior inferior cerebellum as well as parts of the medulla. Um, and so you can affect uh, cranial nerves here, particularly cranial nerve 10. We'll get into that. And then the basal artery. We're not going to talk about this one. What I want you to know is that this causes locked in syndrome. That's a quadriplegia where you basically lose everything motor except for the extraocular muscles. That sounds like H E double hockey sticks. Um, so. Locked-in syndrome is very obvious. Um, you just want to name associate that with basal or artery because that is a common question on step one. All right, the MCA stroke is the most common. We can divide this up into two different types, a superior division and an inferior division MCA stroke, okay? So the superior division MCA stroke will cause a contralateral hemiparesis and it'll uh, affect the face and the hand and the arm, what we would expect. Um, and then typically um, what you'll have then is a Broca's aphasia if it's on the left. Okay, so this will be difficulty producing speech. Now with the inferior division, you'll have, again, very similar symptoms. Um, it'll be upper extremity and whatnot, uh, contralaterally, but this will affect Wernicke's area. And Wernicke's area is responsible for receiving language. So these patients may be able to talk, but when you talk to them, they won't understand you. Whereas with Broca's area, those patients will be able to understand you, but they won't be able to produce speech. And when I say produce, I mean produce meaningful speech. They may be able to make noise, uh, but they won't, they're not going to be fluent, okay? Uh, so both of these will affect the contralateral lower face and the contralateral body. It will affect the nerve that innervates uh, the ipsilateral eye. That is cranial nerve 3. We're talking about extraocular muscles here. So because you're going to affect cranial nerve 3, what you're going to get is a deviation uh, to the side of the infarct. Now, why is that? Well, that's because lateral rectus is working. Um, so if we're losing this, we're losing this, we're losing this, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone. All we have is this. And so we're going to get a deviation towards the side of the stroke, towards the side of the infarct. All right, um, so uh, this is an MCA stroke. Can you see the hypoattenuation here? Is this left or right? It is right. It's right here. How about this one? This one's more obvious. Again, another right one. All right, the anterior cerebral artery is responsible more for uh, the part of the brain that uh, goes to the lower extremity. Okay, so this is going to affect the lower body more than the upper body. And so what you get here most saliently is leg paresis. So these patients will not be able to walk. Whereas with the MCA, you get that facial drooping and, uh, you know, that we classically associate with stroke. These patients will be clumsy and they won't be able to walk. They won't be able to move one side of their, or, you know, one leg. The other leg will be fine. Um, so this can also cause weakness of the pelvic floor musculature, and that's going to result in urinary incontinence. So you've got a patient with a weak leg and a weak bladder that's an ACA stroke. It can also affect the olfactory bulb, that's towards the front of the brain, that will cause anosmia, and it can affect the frontal lobe, that will cause a personality change. That's more long-term symptoms, though, of a stroke. So here, you can see it right here. Now, PCA stroke, this affects the visual cortex, so the most salient features are going to be visual. What I want you to know here is that this is going to cause a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia with macular sparing, okay? This is classically how it shows up on test questions. So you're not going to have this, okay? What you're going to have, uh, let me do this over again. What you're going to have 
is this, where the central part of the visual field is preserved, uh, but you still have that uh, the contralateral hemianopsia. Okay, so the macular sparing tells you that you're dealing with a PCA stroke. They can also get visual hallucinations and visual agnosia. One way that that can present is prosopagnosia. And what that means is they have difficulty recognizing faces. So think of this. Your wife brings you in to the ER. You had a PCA stroke. And you see her. You can see her, but you don't know who it is. You can't recognize her face. However, if she starts talking, you'll say, oh, yeah, that's my wife. I can hear her, but I don't recognize that woman standing in front of me. That is prosopagnosia, difficulty recognizing faces. They can also get this just general visual agnosia where they have difficulty recognizing objects. So you can show them a picture of an apple and they can say, yeah, it's red. It's kind of, I don't know, ovular shaped. Um, or they may see an orange. It's round. It's orange. But I don't know what that is. Is it a, you know, fruit? Is it a vegetable? Is it a, you know, toy? What is it? Um, that's visual agnosia. They can see, but they can't recognize, similar to prosopagnosia. These are the visual tracts. I have a whole video on visual tracts, so I rec recommend that you go and watch that because it'll make this make a lot more sense. So this is a PCA stroke. You can see here the hypoattenuation on the posterior side. These are fairly straightforward. All right, now this is again kind of going over that cranial nerve three palsy, what happens with that. So what you have is again, here's your eye. Excuse my poor artwork here. Remember that we have a medial rectus, a superior rectus, an inferior rectus, a lateral rectus, and then we have a superior oblique which will push it down that way. Okay, now cranial nerve three supplies superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior rectus, inferior oblique, and levator palpebrae superioris, which is responsible for opening the eyelids. Uh, if we lose that and that and that, and all we have is the superior oblique, which, by the way, it should be that way. I forgot what side we were dealing with here. Okay, so superior oblique pushes you down and out. Uh, if we only have lateral rectus and superior oblique, then what you're going to get is an eye that's down and out. Now, we're also losing levator palpebrae superioris, and so that is going to result in this droopy eyelid. So you have a down and out eye and a droopy eyelid. This is going to be ipsilateral to the lesion. So what we have here is a left CN3 uh, a, a palsy or ophthalmoplegia. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move on to the midbrain strokes. I'm just going to give a passing reference here because you're only going to run into this on step one. If you're taking step two or three, you can skip over this. Uh, so a midbrain stroke uh, is Weber's syndrome and Benedict's syndrome, and they both occur due to blockage of a penetrating branch of the PCA. So it's not the whole, not the whole PCA. Uh, so they are very similar in presentation. There's only one big difference between the two. So both of them will uh, affect the substantia nigra. So you can get Parkinsonian-like syndromes. Uh, they both affect the cortical pontine tracts, the pyramidal tracts, and um, we have cortical pontine here again. Uh, so what you're going to expect to see here is an ipsilateral oculomotor palsy because cranial nerve three comes off the midbrain. You're going to have a contralateral hemiplegia because you're affecting the corticospinal tract. And, um, and that's pretty much it. Okay, now with Benedict syndrome, the only difference here is we go a little bit deeper, we go to the red nucleus. And the red nucleus is responsible for gait. And so you will have gait issues along with similar symptoms uh, that we see in Weber syndrome. Okay, this is it. This is pretty low yield stuff. So I don't want to belabor this. All right, now lateral medullary syndrome, also known as Wallenberg syndrome, 
is an infarction to pica. So the characteristic thing that we see in Wallenberg syndrome, I'm going to try to illustrate a guy here. Oh, I'm such a terrible artist. Okay, so here's my little man. All right, those are arms. Um, so what we see with Wallenberg syndrome, the classic thing here is that you have a mix. So you have loss of pain and temperature to the ipsilateral face and loss of pain and temperature to the contralateral body. Okay, that is classic for lateral medullary syndrome. You'll also see it in another syndrome that we're going to go into, uh, but you should really be thinking of Wallenberg or lateral medullary syndrome when you see that. Another thing you're going to see that's going to help you distinguish this is a dysphagia, okay? So difficulty swallowing. They also can get a Horner syndrome, and Horner syndrome is due to uh, infarct of the descending sympathetic tract, okay? So... Uh, you have this mixed lesion uh, for pain and temperature where you've got the ipsilateral face, contralateral body, dysphagia, and Horner syndrome. So this is where it's affected here. Lateral medulla. Um, now I just want to go in here now to lateral pontine syndrome. So lateral pontine syndrome is very similar to lateral medullary syndrome. The diff so you still get that, that mix, the contralateral body, ipsilateral face. Uh, you can still get the Horner syndrome. But here, rather than having dysphagia, we get a central hearing loss. And that's because this affects cranial nerve 8, not cranial nerve 10 so much. So you'll get a hearing loss and a nystagmus. So that points to lateral pontine syndrome as opposed to lateral medullary syndrome. And this is due to an infarct of the AICA as opposed to pica. Okay, now if you wanna know more about these things, I have a sweet little mnemonic. Um, this looks like a lot, but uh, watch this video. I have this mnemonic for brainstem lesions and it'll really help you. Uh, with Weber syndrome, uh, lateral pontine, lateral medullary, and then medial medullary, which I didn't go into, and cerebral pontine angle syndrome, or cerebellal pontine angle syndrome, uh, which uh, this mnemonic will really, really help you. If you're taking step two or three, don't worry about this. If you're taking step one, you might want to go take a look because you'll get uh, some pretty useful information out of that mnemonic. And if you know that mnemonic, um, you'll ace all your questions there. So this is just a recap of kind of what we went into. The last thing I want to point out is a lacunar stroke. Lacunar strokes are deep vessels. Um, so you can get a pure motor stroke. That's the most common. You can get a pure sensory stroke. Um, so there are a number of different ways that lacunar strokes can present, um, but they're quite different from the rest. And, and they are fairly common. Uh, so what you really look for here are isolated uh, focal signs that don't really fit with MCA, ACA, PCA, etc.